Alright, 1 John tonight. 1 John chapter 5. I'm just going to read one verse from 1 John tonight. I've got a lot that I want to cover tonight. And so, I warned everybody I might preach a little longer than normal tonight. So, Amen. you're not allowed to complain. I, 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 I warned you, alright? So, uh, anyway, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Tonight I'm going to talk about the Trinity, and the title of my message tonight is The Trinity, and it's resettling what has already been settled. And the, when it comes to the Trinity, there's been a lot of controversy in the Baptist world that we run with. And you know, even in our own church, before a lot of this stuff broke, I was getting a lot of questions about this. And it's, I'm almost wondering, you know, is there something going on out in the internet world and Hollywood or something that's messing everybody up on this? Because it's just weird how all of a sudden it seems like everybody's getting mixed up on the Trinity. And, you know, and I've not done a lot of preaching on this in the past. And honestly, I didn't even really know there was that much controversy when it came to the Trinity. It seemed like everybody always kind of agreed on the Trinity across religions. And I've been hearing a lot about this, you know, modalism or oneness doctrine when it comes to the Trinity. And I, that's new to me. I, I had, I'd never even heard of this. I didn't know about it. And as I've been hearing a lot of these things and I've been studying it, I've realized, you know what, when it comes to the Trinity, I will admit I've been sloppy in the past and how I preach some things. I've been sloppy in some of my terminology before. So, I mean, if you go back and listen to some of my message, you can probably hear me say some things that aren't completely right. But most of that is just because I wasn't aware of this teaching that's out there. And I want to do a few things tonight. First of all, I hope I'm going to, I'm going to attempt the best I know how to explain what the Trinity is, the roles of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and then especially how you can, you know, I guess um, a list of rules you could say to follow when reading the Bible because there are, I think it is crystal clear in the Bible, the roles of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But there's verses throughout the Bible that look like exceptions. And so when we're reading about the Father, Son, and the Spirit, how do we interpret these things? How do we make sense? And I think I can show you how to do this tonight. And the other thing I want to do too is I want to show the dangers of this oneness teaching, this oneness doctrine, this modalism. A lot of people are they're hearing about this controversy. They're like, I don't see what the big deal is. I don't, I don't see how there's much of a difference. But I do, I do believe that it is a very dangerous teaching. And I, be, I believe it is dead wrong. And now that I know it's out there, I'm going to be a lot more careful on how I am with this stuff. I'm, I'm working on making sure I use my terminology right and that I give you know credit where credit is due when it comes to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so very clearly here in the Bible, you know, it says there's three that bear record. You know, you know, the Father, the Word, the Spirit, and these three are one. Okay, and how do we, how do we make sense out of all this? Because okay? when it comes to God, one thing we need to understand is we are trying to describe what I would call, if I can use some maybe sci-fi terms here, a multi-dimensional God in a three-dimensional world. Okay, And that's going to be hard to do that accurately. And not only am I going to try to describe a multi-dimensional God in a three-dimensional world, I'm going to try to use two-dimensional illustrations to help with that. Okay, So these illustrations, they are not going to be perfect but uh, I do think some of them can maybe help you understand some things. But, you know, Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Notice God, he dwells in eternity. Okay, we are pretty much incapable of explaining things that are outside the realm of space and time, aren't we? You know, but the truth is God is beyond those things. He inhabiteth eternity. We cannot get to heaven in a spaceship. All right. There is no way, you know, we can't get in a rocket and fly out there somewhere and find what's that we physically cannot get there. It is in eternity. It is outside this universe as we know it. It is outside of time and matter. All, everything we know, you know, involves space, time, and matter. And do you understand that God, 
created all of those things out of nothing. God created all of that. God was before space, time, and matter. And so when we're talking about a God that is, you know, beyond what is our knowledge, we should not be surprised when there are some things that the Bible clearly teaches us about him, if they maybe go beyond our comprehension a little bit. Nobody should be surprised by that. And I'm afraid with this oneness thing, it's like they're trying to simplify God. And they're, you know, and they're, you know, I think, bringing God down a little bit. And I don't think that's what we need to do. I don't think that's going to help one bit. And so, you know, while comprehending what it means for there to be one God, when there's three persons that are mentioned, it is, it's difficult for us, but we, we have to believe it. Because that is exactly what the Bible says. There are three that make up one God. Those three are clearly three distinct persons. And so to, I want to show you, there was a guy who made a video against the Trinity, what we believe about the Trinity. And he used this diagram. And I saw that now. He was talking against this. But I'm like, man, this is good. I, I like that. It's good stuff. And it's going to be hard for you to see it from back there. But you notice it has God in the center. You got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? And notice it says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. I agree with this. Okay? I saw that, and he's speaking against that, and I'm like, no. And he's trying to make an argument, too, that no, we believe the same thing as Trinity people. No, you don't, because... The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But they all are three God. Okay, And so, I want to show you from the Bible, I do, I think that chart is absolutely appropriate. And so I want to draw something on here for you that I hope will be a help. So right here we have, and you'll have to pardon my writing, okay? My writing is terrible, okay? My wife makes fun of it all the time, but I can't help it, all right? So we have God here, and God, we can say... There's three, there's the three that is mentioned. You have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Okay? All three of those make up God. You cannot separate any of those from God. The Son is just as much God as the Father is God, and the Spirit is just as much God, and so on and so forth. But all three of these are God. You can't take one out and separate it from God. God is all three of these, but at the same time, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some things from the Bible that I hope will help, because you might see that, you know, that, that's confusing. All right, you know, what's, you know, what's going on here? Well, look at what it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, now understand, when it comes to the Father, Son, and the Spirit, what's happened is, you know, the Bible is real simple. You know, little kids, they kind of under, they understand the concept of Father, Son, and Spirit. They understand that Jesus is God's Son. Jesus is the Son of God. They seem to get that. When you look at this story here in the Bible, it is very clear... You have God the Son in the water being baptized, do we not? But yet there's a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. So where is the Father? The Father's in heaven. The Son's in the water. And then the Spirit descends upon the Son. Right there we see all three kind of in one place, but yet at the same time we see them all separated, don't we? And so clearly right there, all three of them are different. And you say, well, you know, but since they're one God, isn't it appropriate to go ahead and say, you know, the Father is the Son and the Son is the Spirit and so on? I don't believe it is. And I think when we do that, I'm going to show you why it's a problem to say that. I, I do believe that is wrong. So while there are three in the Godhead and all three of them are equal, okay, equal, you know, equal, equally God, the Father is equally God, the Son is equally God and so on. There is an authority structure in the Godhead. And apparently, a lot of these oneness people don't agree with that. But listen, the Father is in authority over the Son. The Son is in authority over the Spirit. We think today, 
that to be an authority over something makes you above that person. And isn't that what the feminists try to tell Christians when they say the husband is an authority over the wife? Listen, the Bible, you know, I believe husband and wife are equal. But clearly, the husband is in authority over the wife, according to God. That's what the Bible teaches. It doesn't make one superior to the other. That's just the authority structure that God put in place. And even in the Godhead, there is an authority structure. And our generation hates that today. And a lot of these guys fighting this stuff are these young millennial types at that age. So yeah, they're going to be against any type of authority structure. But there clearly is an authority structure. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Who was he obeying? He was obeying the Father. And wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, now, what, one, one thing that these people do in the oneness crown, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the Son, obviously, is, His name is Jesus, isn't it? And understand, Jesus is, He's, he's the focal point for us, and for a very good reason. And I, once again, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but yes, Jesus is God, but to say that Jesus is the Father and Jesus is the Holy Spirit, that's just not accurate, and it creates a great problem when we do that. Jesus is God, but he is, He's not the Father and the Spirit. And we see that Jesus is subject to the Father. He was obedient to the Father. Jesus said when He prayed in the garden, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from Me. Nevertheless, not My will, but Thy will be done. Jesus said that in John 5, 30, he said, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the father, which has sent me. Jesus obviously had a will, but he wasn't trying to do his will. He was trying to do the will of the father. He was trying to do what God wanted him to do. Why? Because God's the one in authority. It doesn't make him superior to Jesus. It doesn't make him um, more of God than Jesus was, just like a husband is not superior to the wife, but he has an authority over her. And that's just, that's what the Bible teaches. And so the, the thing that throws people off is that because we know there's only one God and because we know that Jesus is God, and we also know that everyone that teaches that Jesus is not God is a heretic. All right, to say that Jesus is not God, that is total heresy. And so, you know, we know that Jesus is God, so then that must mean that Jesus is the Father, right? You know, and, and the Spirit. And, you know, you don't hear people saying that Jesus is the Spirit that often. But you do hear him saying he's the Father quite often. Why is that? Well, part of the reason for that is because many times, you know, we'll say it like God, Jesus, and the Spirit. Many times when we say God, we're referring to the Father in our minds, aren't we? Many, most of the time, when we talk about God, we are thinking of the Father, but it's appropriate to refer to any of these three as God because all three are God. But that doesn't mean we can say any of them are any of these. And it, it, does, it gets kind of confusing. And, and because you've got all the cults out there that teach that Jesus is not God, sometimes we go a little overboard and, you know, we make applications where we shouldn't make them. It is always appropriate to tell a Jehovah's Witness that Jesus is God or a Mormon that Jesus is God. Okay? But yet, don't, don't turn him into the Father or the Spirit when he's not. There are, there are three that make up one God. And so, to assume that Jesus is all three, not only is it wrong, it doesn't make any sense. If, if we say that Jesus is all three of those things, it begins to create some problems because, well, first of all, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If Jesus, and then uh, 1 John 5, 7, it refers, it says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, 
and the Holy Ghost. So why, why does it not make sense to say that Jesus is the Father or the Holy Ghost? Well, because the Bible clearly says that Jesus, you know, He's the Son. Okay? It doesn't make sense to, you know, to say that you are the Father and the Son. There's clearly a distinction there. It doesn't make any sense. And if the Father sent His Son to the earth, okay, then if it was the Father coming to the earth, why would He just say He sent Himself? Why would He just say, you know, the Father sent Himself to come to the earth? And to say the Spirit, it doesn't make any sense either. And I'll, and I'll show you a few more things. So let's take some elementary things that we know for sure about the roles of the Godhead. And then we're going to look at verses that people will say are contradictions. Okay, so first off, in the Godhead you have the Father. And who was it that sent the Son? The Father, right? The Father sent the Son. We know that for sure when it comes to the Godhead. So who became flesh? The Son. Okay, it was the Word. You have the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And it was the Word that was made flesh. Not the Father that was made flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John, who wrote 1 John chapter 5, is the same one who wrote John chapter 1. Uh, you know, who, is, who is it that died on the cross? Was it the Father or the Son? It was the Son. Who, was, who is our intercessor to the Father? It's the Son. Who is coming back to earth one of these days? The Son. Not the Father, the Son. Jesus Christ. Who was it that was sent at Pentecost? It was the Spirit, wasn't it? Jesus said, I must go away. And I'm going to go away and I'm going to send you a comforter. That was the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent Him. Jesus left and the Spirit came. Well, if Jesus is the Spirit, then how is Jesus leaving? You know, it, it, it really, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know, who... Um, who is it that indwells the believer? It's the Holy Spirit. Okay? Obviously, the Son does not indwell us because a physical body can't inhabit another physical body, can it? But wait, there's verses that say that this, you know, we're indwelt by Christ. I know that. I know that, and we're going to cover that. But no, listen, it's the Spirit that indwells us. It's the Spirit that's in our hearts. But even when it's the spirit that's in our hearts, is it in a blood pumping organ that's in our body? No, I, there's a lot of things that are, you know, they're spoken of figuratively. And sometimes we take them a little too literal. So a couple questions here. First off, is God omniscient or all knowing? Absolutely. God knows everything. No doubt about that. Is God omnipresent? Is God everywhere? Absolutely. God is everywhere. There is no doubt about that. But now what about the Son though? Okay, is the Son all-knowing? Well, while He was on earth, He wasn't. When He was on earth, He had to learn how to talk, didn't He? He had to learn how to walk. He had to learn how to do everything. In fact, in uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 32, even after He started His ministry, after His baptism, it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So while Jesus was on earth, was Jesus God? Yes, he was. But did, was Jesus all-knowing on earth? Obviously he wasn't. He mentioned something. I don't, I don't know when the return is going to be. The Father knows. Therefore, since the Father knew, God was all-knowing. And you know, you, you see that? But Jesus wasn't. Now, does Jesus know now? I don't know. You know the Bible doesn't say for sure. He probably does, but he might not. I'm not going to say he doesn't. But, I, but let me ask you this. Is the Son omnipresent? No. If the Son is omnipresent, then why are we waiting for Him to come back? You know why we're waiting for Him to come back? Because He's not here. He is in heaven. Okay. How can we wait for His return if He's here? Now, is God here? Absolutely. God is here. Why? Because the Holy Spirit. And the Bible makes it very clear that in heaven right now, the Father is on the throne. The Son is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where they are at. Literally, they are there, but yet God is everywhere. Why? Because of the Spirit. All right? So uh, these things are pretty simple. And I think we need to take those things very literally. But 
there are verses that seem to throw a wrench in that. And I'm going to show you how we need to look at these verses. I'm going to show you what the oneness people are missing out on. Missing out on. So, uh, look at... Well, let's look at... A, so, let's look at, uh, at a, what we could say is a contradiction in the Bible, or what maybe they would say is a contradiction according to what we teach, all right? So, John 16, verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Okay? Jesus said, I'm going to go away. And did he do that? Yes, he did. And he sent a Comforter, didn't he? Just like he said. But look what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things that ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Wait a minute. First he said, I'm going to leave you. And then here he's saying, I'll never leave you. How can that be? How can Jesus leave and not leave at the same time? Well, you need to understand many times when you read the words of the Father, or the words of the Son, or the words of the Spirit, many times they will speak on behalf of God or the Godhead of all three. They can do that. It's appropriate for the Son to speak on behalf of God because He is God. Therefore, speaking on behalf of the Father and the Spirit. And so Jesus Christ, the Son in the flesh, He said, yes, I'm going, I am going to leave. But when He said, I will never leave you, you that's God talking. And because His Spirit is with us, God hasn't left us, has He? God is here, isn't He? God is here. God is inside of us because we have the Spirit of God. And so when Jesus said, I'm going to leave, yeah, He did leave. And the Son is in heaven and we're waiting for Him to come back. But God is here because the Spirit is here. The Spirit indwells us. And so I, I don't think that's a contradiction right there. When Jesus said that, when He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, He's speaking on behalf of God right there. Not, not just on behalf of the Son. He's speaking on behalf of God. And so while God is all, you know, all these things, all three of those, and Jesus is God, Jesus is not the part of God that's all present or omnipresent. That is the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit is part of the Spirit, you know, is the Spirit of Christ, Jesus kept His promise, both promises. When He said, I'm going to go away and I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He kept both of those promises. So how do we make sense of the fact that three different verses, in many cases, give credit to three different members of the Trinity on things? Okay, because this is... And so, for example, Jesus' resurrection. Okay? Galatians 1.1 says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ... And God the Father who raised Him from the dead. Paul said very clearly under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that God the Father raised Him from the dead. Okay? So who was responsible for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, according to that, God the Father raised Him from the dead. Romans 8 verse 11 says, But the, if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. So wait a minute. Romans, the sa Paul, the same guy who wrote Galatians, who said the Father raised up the Son, now he's saying the Spirit raised up the Son. So who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus Himself is speaking, and He answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. So who gets credit for the resurrection? Well, God gets credit for the resurrection. God gets credit for the resurrection. You know, and so, you know, the, the truth is, you see, there's, there's an authority structure. Okay? And I, it was the will of the Father for Jesus to come and die on the cross. When Jesus paid the penalty, it was good. God saw that it was acceptable. Jesus died and the Father, at His will, raised Him from the dead, but I believe through the power of the Holy Spirit. God sent the Spirit to raise up Jesus from the dead, but it was Jesus who actually rose from the dead, wasn't it? You see, all three of them played a part. All of God played a part in the resurrection. And so, you know, um, 
Let's, and let's look at another example where we see three different things. And then I'm going to show you something I think will help this make perfect sense. Um, so who actually dwells in us? Okay, I said before, it's clearly the Holy Spirit, right? It doesn't make sense that Jesus dwells in us when we know he has a literal body. And when Jesus is not on this earth right now, he is in heaven. We are waiting for him to come back. But let's look what it says. Look what the Bible says, Romans 8, 9. And ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. It says the spirit of Christ or if Christ be in you, if Christ Ephesians four, six, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Specifically says the Father is in you all. So we in, in these verses, we see all three, you know, the Spirit's in us, Christ is in us, God is in, God, or the Father is in us. How does it say that? Well, here's the thing. If the Spirit is in us, then God is in us. And you understand, once again, the Spirit is able to dwell inside of us because... The son made payment for our sins, but the son did that at the will of the father. Okay. And so one more example of where we see maybe some contradictory things, and then I'll give you the example that'll make it real clear for you. Matthew chapter one, verse 20, Jesus birth. All right. Jesus is the son of the father, right? You know, you're, that's what a father is. Someone who has a son, right? But look what it says in Matthew 1 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife for that, which is conceived in her is of the Holy ghost. So wait, wouldn't that make the Holy ghost, the father, if he's conceived of the Holy ghost, then wouldn't the spirit be the father instead of the father. And so how are we going to make sense of this? Well, the father must be the spirit. And if the father is the spirit, the spirit's the son and, and so on and so forth. No, that is, that is not the case, okay? And without going to all the scriptures, once again, Christ coming to earth, the Son coming to earth, it was something that all of the Godhead was involved in. It was the will of the Father for the Son to come to earth. The Son has always been around. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All three of these have always been. As long as there's been God, there's been all three of these. As long as there's been a Son, there's been a Father, and so on. And when the Father, at His will, sent the Son, okay, the Son became flesh, didn't He? How did He do that? How did the Son become flesh? How did He go from being in heaven to literally becoming a tiny little embryo inside of a woman? The Son that was in heaven literally became a physical man and was in the mother's womb. Well, how did, it, how did he do that? How did he get there? Well, it was the Father who sent him and it was the Spirit who placed him in the womb. The Spirit's the one who does the work. The Spirit's kind of the one that's, that's always is, is working and actually doing things. But it's done at the will of the Father. So now let me put this in earthly terms Maybe to make you help this, all right? So, because if you remove any member of the Trinity, you no longer have, it's no longer God. You know, the three together make up one God, and while they all have their distinct roles and positions, you do see different members credited sometimes because they all play a part in everything. They're always together. They're always in unity. Trinity, try unity. They're always unified. Okay, and so for example, if you ask me to mow your lawn, you're like, Brother Tommy, I need my lawn mowed. I was like, all right, I can help you out with that. But then I send my son to mow your grass and the job gets done. You know, it would be appropriate if you thanked me for that, but it would also be appropriate if you thanked my son for it too. Okay, because truth is he did it at the will of his father. I was the one who sent him, okay? My son doesn't have a driver's license yet. You know, if he's going to come over and he's going to mow your grass, I've got to get him over there. I've got to send him. 
I've got to okay it. You know, I'm his authority. And so when I, when I send him and he submits to my authority and he gets the work done, you can credit both of us if you want. Okay. I got thanked yesterday for helping brother Gomer do his, uh, you know, stuff in his garage, but I didn't do anything. I just sent the boys over. Tommy, Jason, and Solomon did all the work. But I, but I sent them. And he thanked me. And you know what? He thanked them too. Yeah. And completely appropriate. But, you know, it, 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 when he thanks me for that, is he saying, you know, Brother Tommy, thank you. You were the one who physically, you know, you scraped that paint out the garage and you moved all that stuff. No, but it did get done because of me. He asked me, I made it happen through them. That's a wonderful thing about having boys. It, it's a great thing to be able to just watch work get done at your command. I mean, it is, it's great. You know, I'm not looking forward to them growing up and leaving the house because uh, then um, my girls are going to have to start picking up the slack. But anyway, um, but, you know, it, it's a pro. But, you know, at the same time, you could say, all right, well, there's one more person we need to thank. You know, if I, if I send my son to mow your grass, well, that's the lawnmower. All right. The lawnmower is actually doing the work, isn't it? But the lawnmower, it doesn't do anything by itself. It works at the will of my son who's riding that thing around. You know, he's the one who is operating it and controlling it. He's not actually cutting the grass. The lawnmower is actually cutting the grass. It's actually the blades that are spinning that are cutting the grass. But yet, you would, you would thank him for cutting your grass and you would thank me for making sure the job got done. And it's the same thing with many things that have been done. It, yeah, we can thank any of them because of the fact that it was done at the will of the Father. He follows the will. The Son follows the will of the Father. The Spirit, He'll do the work for either of those. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is the one that does the work in the hearts of people. You know, when it comes to salvation, it was the Father sent the Son. It was the Son who paid the penalty for sins. But even when we get saved today, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work in people's hearts. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't do a work in someone's heart, then that person's not going to get saved. That person's not going to believe. But yet, we can thank, you know, we thank, that's why we thank God. When we're thanking God, we're just kind of thanking all three. They all three play a role. And you see, the bad thing about some of these examples I'm using that are earthly, we struggle sometimes because there's a lot of times we're not in unity, aren't we? Hey, there's a, the other day, we got the grass mowed here at the church in less than an hour. Because we've got the mower that's here. I bring ours from home. But we've been having lots of lawnmower issues lately. And we're con I'm constantly fixing stuff on the lawnmowers when we're here. And so it takes forever. Well, we didn't have any issues and so everything, in less than an hour, we got it done. We couldn't believe it. We're like, man, that was awesome. That, that was wonderful. Why? Because everything worked together like it's supposed to. And that doesn't happen that often. But with the Father, Son, and the Spirit, they always work together perfectly. Everything gets done, everything gets done right according to the will of the Father. How many times have you had a plan to get some kind of project done and it didn't work out right? Because many times in our projects, we are depending on other people. And they kind of throw a wrench and what we're doing. But that never happens with the Trinity. They're always together. They always do the right thing. And so when you're reading through the Bible, you will see the Father sometimes may be credited for something that Jesus Christ did. But yet, that's okay because of the fact that, yes, it, was, it wouldn't have gotten done if it weren't for the Father. And you might see Jesus credited for something that was actually the Holy Spirit that had done it. But that's okay because the Holy Spirit wouldn't have done it had it not been for the will of Jesus Christ. Had it not been for Him sending Him. So that's why we see that. Because there is, there's that authority structure and they all play a part and they all play their role. And so, you know, and we see even within us, we have the flesh and the Spirit, don't we? Even within us. But the problem with us is they work against each other, don't they? Our flesh is constantly at war with the Spirit. And so the difference with God is that the, in the Trinity, you have holy, holy, holy. And therefore, they work together, I mean, perfect. At, you know, as one, they, are, they make up one God. Where with us, even in a husband and a wife, okay? you know, these two, the twain have become one flesh. And you know what? When you have a marriage where both are in their role, doing their part, like they're supposed to do, it's a great marriage. But when they all start doing their own thing, then it ends up creating trouble, doesn't it? 
whenever they're not in unity. It, it creates a lot of problems. And with the Trinity, that never happens. With us, with ourself, just with the spirit and the flesh that we have, they are never together. They are always contrary to each other. And so it's a great problem. And so you know, we can understand our spirit and flesh thing. We understand that. But for some reason, people can't understand that within God, that there are those three things. It's just all of them are holy. And so even Christ, we see about he had a different will than the Father. You know, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. What's going on? You know, is, is Jesus schizophrenic here? You know, thinking, you know, as Jesus, no, I don't want this, but as the Father, yeah, he got... No, he had a different will than the Father, but it didn't change what he did one bit, did it? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, and he did the will of the Father. And this Father, he often speaks on behalf of the Son, and the Spirit often speaks on behalf of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I remember when I was a kid, I would hear that sometimes. I would hear somebody ask my dad if he would do something, and he'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll take care of that. And I'd be sitting there, and I'd be just be like, he's talking about me. <laughs> and I, I knew what that meant. And yeah, he got it done. He made sure it got done through me. And, you know, and, that's all, and we see that in the Bible quite a bit. So just because it says you know, Christ is in you, okay, well, Christ is in us because His Spirit is in us. His Spirit is keeping us saved. You know, the Holy Spirit is why we don't lose our salvation. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Well, how did we get the Holy Spirit? Well, we got it through Jesus Christ. So yes, we have Christ because we have His Spirit. And there's many examples we could use even on earth. You know, for example, we had to hear all, you know, in uh, 2012, you know, during the election season, we had to keep hearing about Obama killing Osama bin Laden. But did Obama kill Osama bin Laden? No, it was the military that did. But even within the military, it wasn't just, it was one person that actually gave him the fatal shot, I think, you know, but yet since it was done under his authority, while I hate to give Obama credit for anything, I think you got to do that. Yeah. He killed Osama bin Laden. Supposedly. I never got to see the pictures of the body. I'm not convinced. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. But we, we see that all the time. And yet, for some reason, when, when that, these very things happen in the Bible, you know, all of a sudden we get real literal. Nobody thought during the election when Obama was saying, I killed Osama. I don't want to mix those up. It's easy to do. They have so much in common. All right. when he, nobody thought Obama saying he pulled the trigger. No, nobody thought that. Everybody understands that. And it, when it comes to the Bible, when we see the Father saying that He's done things, that it was actually the Son or the Spirit that did, it's not saying that He physically did it. It's just it was done under His authority. We get that in earthly things, but for some reason we can't get it when it comes to the heavenly things. I'm afraid some of these people have an agenda and they're, just, they're being stubborn is what a lot of this is. And so the main problem with this oneness doctrine is it tries to fit all of the Godhead into the Son. And that's not right. Jesus Christ is the focal point of everything for us because He's the one that paid for our sins. You know, He's the one that we have to have faith in if we're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And while it's true that Jesus Christ is the one that we go through to get to the Father, you know, and the Spirit, it doesn't make Him all three of them. And so... You know, Jesus Christ, He was a specific person in the Trinity. And there are, there's three, and these three make up one God. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, people, they'll take that and say, well, that means Jesus is all three of those things. No. In Him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It just means the Spirit was in Him. The Father was in Him. It doesn't mean He was all three of those things. It's just all of the Godhead dwells in Him. But what does that mean? What is, that, what is the significance of all of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Him bodily? It's because it's through Him that we get the Father and we get the Spirit. 
It's through Him we get those things. We don't just go directly to the Father. We have to go through the Son. Because He's the one that paid for our sins. He was the one who came to earth. He was the part of God that came to this earth and died for our sins. In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Oops, did I mess up? And how sayest thou, then show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, 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 I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, and the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now notice right there, he says, I go to my Father. Well, if he is the Father, then how, why does he need to go anywhere to get to the Father? Okay? But yet at the same time, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What's he talking about there? Once again, people all of a sudden, when they want to, they get overly literal. Hey, now what have we, we've been going through the book of John. What has the whole book of John been all about? Believe in Christ. Believe in Christ. Whosoever believeth in him, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. You know, I, I am all these things. He's telling these people, if you will believe me, you'll never thirst again. How come we don't get all literal there? How come we, you know, we don't tell people, if you get saved, you're never going to need to drink a cup of water again. Well, because that's not what he was talking about. He's speaking spiritually here, isn't he? You know, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never need to eat for the rest of your life. We don't say that. We understand he was talking spiritually there. And, and how do we eat the Father? How do we eat that bread? We believe His words. How do we drink that water? We believe His words. How do we see the Father? We believe Him. We see Him. We believe Him. And when we do that, we will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But the Bible says, Behold, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So wait, do we not have salvation yet? Well, listen, we don't have the full package yet. But be, when you believe on Christ, you are saved right then. In other words, there is no changing it, no doubt about it. God, who sees the end from the beginning, He sees you as saved. While we still are pretty sinful right now, God sees us as He sees the full picture and He sees us like Christ. We will go up at His return. We will have a body that's like His glorious body. Yes, we don't right now, but there is nothing that can change the fact that we will, it's as good as done in the eyes of God. When you called on the Lord for salvation, you got salvation. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you got salvation, you were saved, but yet it's crystal clear just by looking at all of you, y'all haven't got the full package yet. Okay? And the thing is, when Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When He's saying, if you've seen me, He's talking spiritually here. If we've seen Him, if we understand who He is, if we believe Him, then we've got the Father. Just like we've got salvation. And, we're, and people are taking that and they're going overly literal with it. Well, if we're going to do that, then we've got to be just as literal in the rest of John and say that Jesus is not just the Father, but Jesus is bread. You know, and Jesus is water. Spiritually, he is, but not physically. And Jesus physically was not the father. The father was in him. The spirit was in him. And I, I believe that the spirit, you know, the father was in him because the spirit was in him. You know, he gave, you know, he gave him the spirit, not with measure. And that was from God. Therefore, they were in him, even though God was in heaven. Because the Spirit was in him, you know, God was in him. And so, understand the way these things work, the way the delegation works. You know, Romans 4.17 says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, 
even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Everybody needs to have this verse memorized. When God many times calls things that are not as though they were. So for example, you could say, we are not saved. But God says we are saved. Why is that? Why, you know, because of the fact, because God sees the end and because we believed on Christ, God has already seen us in heaven. He refers to us as saved. He calls those things that be not as though they were. And so, yeah, it's appropriate for us to say that we are saved right now, even though we don't look like it, even though we don't act like it. Because we have the promise, it's as good as having the whole package. We can't lose it. We have eternal life. And you can't lose something that is eternal. And so, I, b- I believe it's the same rule applies when we're looking at, the, at these things here when it comes to the Godhead. So when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, it's the same thing as saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, even though the Bible says, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And so, you know, why is this oneness doctrine such a heresy? Because what the oneness people are saying, they're saying, you know, the Son is the Father. And so I, I want to draw another diagram here for you. I want to show you why this is so bad, all right? So, if the Father equals Jesus, and if the Son equals Jesus and if the spirit equals Jesus it creates a problem and this is what the oneness people teach this is what the Pentecostals teach that it's all Jesus there's a problem if that's the case okay now I do believe that the father is equal to the son and the son is equal to the spirit, just like a husband is equal to the wife and the wife is equal to the husband. But I don't believe that the father equals Jesus and that G- the son equals Jesus and the spirit equals Jesus. Because here's the thing. If Jesus equals the father, or Jesus equals the Holy Spirit and Jesus equals the word, then the, the Jews, the Mormons, the JWs, all right, we need to stop calling them the Jehovah's false witnesses because it makes it sound like Jehovah has false witnesses, all right? <laughs> we, got to, we got to think of a better name for those people. But the J- these people are all trying to go to the Father, okay? They take away the importance of Jesus. But listen, if the Father equals Jesus, then aren't they going through Jesus? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, okay? And so if the Father equals Jesus, then it would be appropriate... To say, yeah, you know, the Jews, they're just trying to go to the Father. That's fine. If, it's the, if the Spirit equals Jesus, then the Pentecostals, the, uh, you know, the Charismatics, the, um, the repent of your sins crowd. Okay? How do they get in there? Well, because the repent of your sins crowd teaches if you're going to get saved, you have to have a head-on collision with the Holy Ghost. You know, there's got to be a change that takes place in your life. You know, he's got to he's got to transform you. He's got to turn you from your sins and change you, and then you'll be saved. You know, the Pentecostals, you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, you've got to speak in tongues. You got to get baptized. You know, you know the Charismatics, you got to get slain in the Spirit. You got to have this emotional experience with the Spirit. But here's the thing: if the Spirit equals Jesus, then why are they wrong? They're all going through the Spirit. And if the Spirit's Jesus, you know, because how much doctrine do you have to have right to be saved? The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That jailer that asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? So, well, you're going to have to learn the Baptist doctrine first. You're going to have to learn all the things about the... You know, he didn't, they didn't teach him a whole bunch of doctrine. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, and I guarantee you, these people probably know more doctrine than that jailer did. You know, these groups probably know more doctrine than that jailer did. But the truth is, the way to get the, the, the saved, okay, those who are saved, we go through Jesus Christ. We go 
through Jesus. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If we're, if we're going to get the Father, we have to go through Jesus. And when we go through Jesus, He baptizes us with the Spirit, doesn't He? Jesus, is the, Jesus baptizes us with the Spirit. Through Jesus, we get all of the Godhead. We don't get it through the Father. We don't get it through the Spirit. We get all of those things through Jesus Christ. And if we're going to start saying, eh, it all equals the same thing, start messing with the Word, saying it all equals the same thing, then why aren't these people wrong? And you know what? Why don't we do this too? You know, and I, I'm not saying these people go this far, but it could be taken this far. Well, what if Allah equals God too? And if this is just, if Jesus... You know, if, if the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, these are all just three different modes that God goes into. These are three different hats that He puts on. These are three different ways that Jesus manifests Himself to us. Well, then why only three? And I heard a priest says, you know, why not four or five? Why not a hundred? And you know, why not? Maybe to the Muslims, He manifested Himself as Allah. And maybe the Chinese, he manifests himself as Buddha. And the Hindus, he manifests himself as whatever. You know, they've got a ton of gods. Why not all those things? But no, listen, that's not how it works. It is of utmost important that we understand the roles of those in the Godhead because when it comes to our salvation, Jesus Christ is the focal point. He is the one that we have to go through to get to the Father. We're not trying to get to Jesus. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. We're trying to get to the Father. But if we're going to get to the Father, we have to go through Jesus. And, and he, Jesus was very clear about that. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, without who? The Word. Was not anything made that was made. This is showing that the Son was always there. As long as there's been the Father, there's been the Son. They've always been together. They've always been around. In John 10.30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Well, the Spirit's, notice how the Spirit's not mentioned there because He wasn't revealed as God yet. Okay? But then, and it says in John 10.31, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone Him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Making himself God is not necessarily making himself the Father, is it? But he was, he was, making, himself, he was making himself God. And, you, and that's, that's not necessarily making himself the Father. Isaiah 9, 6. This is the big one they like to use. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Right there, that proves that Jesus was the Father. But no, what that verse is saying there, that verse is showing that hey, this child that's going to be born, this child is God. Okay? That child is God, and once again, we do see Jesus often speak for the Father and for the Spirit because they are all God. That's not saying that the child is the Father. It's just showing that the, hey, this child will be God. And so you can't just take one verse like that and just throw out all the clear things that are in the Bible. And so you know, the, it's not just showing the child will be born uh, it, you know, it's showing that the child will be born will be God. And so when you, when you talk to God, you're talking to all three. They're always in unity. They are always three, and that's why I call them the Trinity. Father often speaks for the Son. The Son often speaks for the Spirit, vice versa. So, uh, you know, I can't speak for all three, you know, or because, you know, I, you know, or for, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, the examples I've given before, you know, I can't, I can't always do it, but we see though, God does God all, or any of them will often speak for all three. And just kind of an illustration here. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but think the thief on the cross. All right. This is a big one that people use. Somebody asked me about this the other day and I wasn't ready to answer this one. I should have been, but remember what the thief on the cross said. He said, remember me when thou 
most thy kingdom. And Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. But wait a minute. We know from the book of Acts that Jesus went to hell for three days, didn't he? So wait a minute. How could, if Jesus went to hell when he died, then how did the thief, how was the thief with him that day? Well, Jesus was speaking as God right there. That thief went to heaven, and who do you think he met when he was in heaven? He met the Spirit. And that Spirit, I believe, looked like Jesus. Just like Jesus in the image of the Father. So, for example, if I die before you die, okay, you're going to stick this body in the ground, but then if you die, you're going to meet me in heaven, aren't you? It's going to be my Spirit, though. I think it'll, I think you'll recognize me. I think there'll be similarities, but my body's still in the ground. And the son, he did, the son, he went to hell. But when he said, you'll be with me in paradise, he's speaking as God because that thief went and he was in heaven with God. And so, but I do, I believe that Jesus, I believe the soul of Jesus went to hell, not the father. Okay, because what did it say? Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And sometimes people use the example too. Well, you know, the Father is the soul, the Son is the body. Okay, but the problem with that is Jesus said, "Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell." Well, if his, if that's the soul, then it would be the Father that went to hell. But it, no, it was. Jesus' soul that went to heaven because the body, it was in the tomb those whole three days. It says, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one. I believe talking about the body of Jesus Christ to see corruption. It didn't see corruption. It didn't rot away and deteriorate because he rose three days later. But the son, okay, the son went to hell. Not the father, the son did. So we, we see that you know, Jesus wasn't a soulless body walking around. He was still the son. Just like this right here, this isn't just me. Okay, I've got a soul, and that's who it, I really am. And this body is going to rot away one of these days. And so, you know, uh, you know Je- yeah, Jesus did. The son went to hell and not the father. The father was in heaven, but Jesus Christ, the son, went to hell while his body stayed in the grave those three days. And so, you know, the mistake that these people are making is they won't take certain verses literally. And, you know, the verses that they took take literally, they shouldn't. And then they're taking other verses literally that they should not. You know, for once again, Jesus isn't literally in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is not literally in the blood pumping organ. That is in our body. That's speaking figuratively. And the roles of the Godhead are very clear. This is a, and it's a foundational truth that people shouldn't be struggling with. And while we understand certain aspects are hard to understand, we shouldn't be surprised because He's God. You know, He's going to be a little more complicated than we are. And you know, many people they're getting discouraged by all the controversy surrounding this. You know, it's like oh, all this division. I can't stand all this division, you know. You know, we, we can't have this fighting going on in our movement. You know, we can't have people getting thrown out and being called heretics and stuff. But let me tell you something. I personally believe this whole thing is very good for our movement. I think it's a good thing. Because you know what the problem with mainstream IFB? They quit caring about doctrine a long time ago. It's all politics now there. And look at some of the doctrines being taught in the mainstream IFB. Look at some of the people that they are letting speak in IFB churches. doesn't matter if they're heretics. doesn't matter if they're dispensational or hyper-dispensational. doesn't matter if they mess with the name of Jesus. As long as you're lined up politically and you we're buddy-buddies and we have each other preach for us and give each other big love offerings, it's all good. And look at the garbage that's being taught. All it is, it's about politics and building power and building influence. You know, And pastors being challenged with doctrine, it's a good thing. It's gonna. This is sh- gonna sharpen us up. It's helped me. It's gonna cause us to dig a little deeper in the scriptures, which will keep us from going into greater error. And you know, I think I think about when I when I started talking with with uh, you know 
until a few months ago, 100% of my preacher friends were pre-trip. 100%. And you know what? I'm, when I, Pastor Manley Perry, he was the first one I talked to and I made friends with. And then shortly after that, Pastor Anderson. And let me tell you something. You, you want to talk about a breath of fresh air when I started talking to those guys. Not because of their doctrine. You know the thing that I appreciate about those guys? They were so unapologetic about what they believed. You know, I, I remember Brother Perry, he talked to me one time, and he was kind of checking up on what I believed on some things. And man, these guys, they're, they're not looking to just recruit whoever they can get on their side. Man, if, I, if you're not right doctrinally, man, they're not looking to just, you know, make friends. This is what, they, they, no apologies whatsoever. They're not, they didn't beat around the bush about nothing. They told it like it was. And you know what? I was, I would talk to them. And if there was things, you know, and I, I kind of tested some things because, you know, I already came from an extremely controlling group of people. I was talking about before, you know, if they don't approve of your friends list, you're not allowed to have anything to do with them. And I was hoping I wasn't going to get myself into something like that. But you know what I noticed too? I was just the same way with them. And if there was something where we just didn't completely agree, it wasn't, okay, whatever. They tell me if they didn't agree. And you know what? There, there just was, there's no rump kissing in that group. None. And that's all they do in the other group. And it makes me sick. I like people that will tell me how it is. I like people that if you ask them, hey, what do you think about something? And they don't beat around the bush. They just tell it like it is. I love that. And so the fact, you know, that this, this thing, I, it's sharpening us up. It's helping us. And you know what else it's doing? It's weeding out the phonies. Because there's going to be phonies. Those who are humble will fix their positions. They'll do like me and say, hey, I've been sloppy with some of my terminology. Yeah, I've said some things wrong. You know what? I'm going to be a lot more careful. I'm going to, I'm going to study a little harder on this. I'm going to make sure I'm right. And we are, we're going to fix our position. We're going to come out closer to God. Those who are punks, they're going to get bent out of shape. They're going to throw big fits. You know, they're going to take their toys and go home. We don't need those people in the movement. The guy I was watching the video is showing this picture. He was like, you know, like, oh, I'm fired up right now. I'm fired up. I had people tell me to go jump in a lake. Okay. I think that was nice. They told you to go jump in a lake because they know where you're heading. There's no water and they're telling you to enjoy it while you can. I think that I think they were blessing the guy. I mean, I was like, you got told to jump in a lake. Big deal. Listen, I've been called a punk before. I've been called a punk before because I've gone against the establishment because I don't just walk lock step and everything. But listen, there's a difference between a punk and a real man of God. And it's easy to tell it is the real man of God has actually consistently done something for a long period of time. Okay. But a punk wants instant recognition and they, and they'll take shortcuts to get it. You know, me, yeah, I've gone against the establishment and some things, but you know what? I've got a long, I've read through the Bible over 30 times. You know, before I changed my position on the pre-trib doctrine, I, but when I first started coming around, I was like, I'm not doing this quick. I read through my Bible three times during that time. I listened to every message I could. I talked to every preacher I could. I quit talking to the young preachers because the young preachers, first of all, they didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And that was obvious. They wouldn't rebuke me. I wanted them to rebuke me. I didn't want to change my position. I wasn't looking for some new thing like the punks do. I didn't want to change my position. And, and, but when I would talk to the older preachers, all they would do is call me names and flip out. And that sure didn't help me out. But you know what? I liked what they were doing better than the young guys. But I, did. I, I didn't go behind anybody's back. And the, a lot of these guys are starting this stuff. They're going behind their pastor's back. Listen, if I wouldn't have been a pastor, if I'd have had a pastor, he'd been the first guy I talked to. My dad was one of the first guys I talked to about it. Why? Because I wasn't trying to hide anything. I'm not just trying to start a movement and cause problems. And I did for a long time. I consistently studied I, for three years before I actually preached something about it in church. But these punks, man, all this they get saved and three or four years later, they know more than the pastor does. They know more than... You know, all of religion does. And they start questioning everything because they want to start a movement. And so you know, we need to remember we're in a real battle. There's going to be casualties. There's going to be traitors. 
There's going to be some defeats. We're going to lose some momentum. We're going to lose some ground. But don't get discouraged because we were warned these things would happen. Let's just get encouraged when the devil starts fighting. Because that's always a good sign we're doing something right. The devil... The devil does not need to infiltrate the Presbyterian church. They're already taken over. Okay? He doesn't need to sow tares amongst the wheat there. There's no wheat there. Okay? He's going to be doing it in the churches that are preaching the truth. That's where the stuff's going to come in. And thank God for the preachers who aren't afraid to throw people out of their church when they do it. And to call them what they are. And to call them punks. And to call them heretics. And to call them devils and lost. And all those things. Because they are those things. The mainstream IFB, they've gotten so political. It's all about building numbers and, you know, building their power. And they are, they are letting the leaven leaven the whole lump. And we shouldn't let that happen. So don't get discouraged by this stuff. I'm encouraged by it. I think it's a good thing. We're going to come out of this better and stronger than ever. First John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. We believe in one God. There is only one God, but within that one God, we have a Father, a Son, and a Spirit. And there are three. There are three that make up one God. And we need to not get so smart that we all of a sudden know more than the Bible. And we need we don't need to start or we don't need to make the mistake of trying to simplify it. This is God that we're talking about. He's going to blow our mind. And one of these days when we see him, we'll understand a lot of these things, but we can't, we can't go changing this stuff. I believe it will. I believe it'll lead to this ecumenical stuff. And it's all Jesus. Why couldn't he have manifested? You know what? If there's three, you know, if there's three gods or whatever, you know, why couldn't he manifest himself in another book besides this one? You know, it, it is, it, it's, that is a, that is a dangerous teaching that clearly a lot of other religions have bought into because many are, you hear about these interdenominational or interfaith, interfaith churches. Folks, that's a joke. That is wicked. And I, I I'm going to stay as far away from that as I can. So I hope this was clear for you tonight. So with that, let's all stand together.